Remington Steve won't be seen tonight, so we can bring you a very special episode of The Gen X Files. Welcome to The Gen X Files. I'm Jim. I'm Adam. And today's show is all about Logan's Run. Run, Logan, run. <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, it's funny because I like to think about this happening at the same time as Zardoz because it's like maybe 19 years before I think Zardoz. Yeah. Um, or after, I don't remember, but, uh, but yeah, I like to think that in America, Logan's Run is happening and then in England, Zardoz is happening. It would seem, yes, because Logan's Run is more lazy American children getting everything handed to them <laughs> and then being gullible enough to think that, hey, we're just going to be reborn again. Right, right. Once the computer blows us up in our weird mask costumes and then Europe's <laughs> so just like, bizarre. you know, Europe again does we, what Europe does, which is pretty colonial. You know, we, we already have everything. We're bored. We want to kill ourselves. Yes. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's kill everyone. Let's watch yeah. them kill each yeah. other. The brutes. Yeah. Uh, I just, it, it just was ironic that they're similar in time period, yeah. being that they're so far away. From and us. also similar in the, in kind of the youth taking yeah. over. I think there's almost like this fear of oh, yeah. that generation, you know, what's going to happen when the hippies take over? They're going to ruin the whole country, turn yeah. it into a communist, Marxist, fascist, Marxist, communist, fascist, socialist. Hello. There you go. There you go. Can you give me the acronym for that? Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, uh, yeah, I love Logan's Run. It's a great movie. I will admit, uh, we just watched it uh, recently, and I do think there could have been probably 20 minutes cut out of it. Yeah, the third act <laughs> drags a little. But that's <laughs> indicative of all 70s sci-fi, mostly. I, I don't know if I totally agree with that, because so far, up to now, we've watched a lot of sci-fi this summer. Right. And, and this is the first one for me that drug a little bit. Yeah, well... It's not that I disliked it. It has the same kind of meteor problem yeah. as... Yeah, There's kind of not enough story for the movie, so they have yes. to kind of pad it, with, and they kind of pad it in weird ways in this movie. But this movie, I think what's really funny is I haven't seen this movie since I was under 30, and now I'm the oh, age of the yeah. old man yeah. with all my cats. Yeah, um, you're actually four years older than the <laughs> old man. In the, in the really? <laughs> no, no, no. I meant the character. I don't know how old he was when he did this movie, he but grew, he wasn't. He no. I mean, he had he like really bad old, makeup I mean, on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, I'm not going to say that the special effects and the makeup were top notch, but <laughs> much like the special effects. <laughs> yeah, I said special effects and makeup. Yeah, and special effects oh, makeup. And special effects makeup. Yeah. But uh, but I will say that it's very very 70s. Like yes. The whole model of the town yes, and yes. the little tube transporting and the costumes. Oh, it's the costumes. Oh, so 70s. Yeah. Yeah. It is. That's why it's in our 70s sci fi yeah. month because it really just is so 70s. And it really, really helps with our stoner sci-fi month, if you're really high when you watch this movie. Yeah, the higher the better, baby. Uh, that opening sequence is fantastic, where they're all floating around in the wires and the floating up into the carousel or yeah, whatever. Yeah, Well, here's what yes. I would do. I would get a red edible <laughs> and put it in the palm of your hand, <laughs> stick it there, and then eat it. And then, <laughs> then eat it. Yeah, because it's like yeah. you're, you know, you're eating your, it's your last crystal. Day. Yeah, yeah. Well, because yeah. especially, I mean, especially if you're over 30, come on. Well, right, right. All right, well, take yourself back, 1976. Yeah. Uh, in the month of March, the Cray 1, the first commercially developed supercomputer, is released by Seymour Cray's Cray Research, with the first purchaser being the Energy Research and Development Ad Administration, also known as ERDA, in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Yeah, home of the Whopper. <laughs> <laughs> That's NORAD. Uh, March 22nd, Star Wars begins filming in Tunisia. Yeah, baby. Uh... Which I thought was interesting because the special effects get so much better with Star Wars. Yeah, especially yeah. the model building. <laughs> yes. Uh, April 16th, as a measure to curb population growth, the minimum age for minimum age for marriage in India is raised to 21 years for men and 18 years for women. I I don't know what it was. I like that it was a measure to curb population growth. So they just like, yeah, you can't get to wait until you're 18 to get married. Well, they read, they read um, 
make room, make room. <laughs> and they were like, no, man. Yeah. We can't let this happen. We can't eat people. Uh, checking in with today, this did not work, as India's soon going to be the largest populated country in the world. Yeah. They, uh, they like effing. And <laughs> they like having the babies. They like effing. Um, yeah, and also bicentennial, man. It's a, a yeah, 200 years, baby. Yeah. Well, I we right. Uh, we just the movie came out before then, so right. I include it. Uh, June twenty third, Logan's Run is released in theaters. Yeah, didn't we celebrate the bicentennial on July fourth? Uh, yes, of seventeen seventy six. Correct. Nice. Yeah, but I will say that though that April sixteenth, that was two years before I was born. Two years to the day. Wow. Yeah. It was a sad time. It was a uh, lonely earth. Apparently, the curb of the population growth did not work with my parents. <laughs> yeah, well, they're not Indian. <laughs> that is true. Uh, Logan's Run starts with the 1967 novel of the same name, written by William F. N- William F. Nolan and George Clayton Johnson. Yeah. Uh, William F. Nolan loved science fiction, so he started publishing fanzines in the 1950s. He Crazy. Worked, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the pre-Usenet groups of the Gen X. Yeah, yeah. you would... What you would do is you would type up your fanzine, and then you would mimeograph it. Oh, yeah. Then you would put it in an envelope, and then you'd mail it out. And then people sometimes would subscribe. Yeah, fanzine. You make some money. Yeah. Well, usually it would just cover the postage. (laughs) Yes, yes. They did it because they loved it. Uh, So no one's fanzine. Right. It's a takeoff of magazines. Those of you who don't know, magazines were like (laughs) picture books and storybooks, like iPads, but you, but they you actually turned pages. Yeah, they had actual they were glossy, mm-hmm. had color photos, it was writing on. You couldn't change the screens. Yeah, I tried. I've tried many times. I know. Yeah, you so, get very frustrated. <laughs> Nolan works for Hallmark Cards Inc., writing verses and illustrating greeting cards before moving to California with his parents. Hmm. While working at an office in Southern California, he met Charles Beaumont. Beaumont had a number of horror and science fiction short stories published, and was instrumental in Nolan becoming a published author. Ugh. Can you imagine? Being in the commissary of that company, and the two of them are huddled over a table, like, oh, man, did you ever see oh. the man with oh, no just, brain? Oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, like science fiction. I'm not as much as horror, but I like horror more than science fiction. Just wait. It gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Beaumont was an extremely prof- prolific writer, writing 22 episodes of The Twilight Zone. Nice. Yeah. Uh, Nolan was a close friend to radio writer Norman Corwin, as well as speculative writer Ray Bradbury. He was also a member of the influential Southern California School of Writers in the 1950s and 60s, known informally as the quote-unquote group. The group. Yeah. Uh, Many of whom wrote for Alfred Hitchcock Presents, The Twilight Zone, Star Trek, and other popular series of the day. We're science fiction guys. Uh, If you can just imagine all of them sitting around a table. (laughs) It would stink. You know it stank. (laughs) Big stinks. Nolan had a long career in the film industry, primarily working with Dan Curtis, who directed the TV movie The Night Stalker and the TV movie The Night Strangler. Nice. Yeah. George Clayton Johnson, the co-writer of the novel, was also a part of the group. Uh, and <laughs> you know, they love that. Uh, <laughs> hi, um, hi, is this uh, Musso and Franks? <laughs> yeah. I'd like to make a reservation for the group. <laughs> Six of us, 8.30. You know, you know there is some concierge who's going, oh, the triggers. Uh, Marty, it's that guy calling with the group again. They always come in here and stank up the place. Uh, tell them we're all booked up. Hey, man. You got to learn. Well, hey, man. They Hygiene were, is important. They were making a lot of money. I should say a lot of money. They were making money as writers. So. Yeah, they were. Uh, in 1959, Johnson wrote the story, I'll Take Care of You, for Alfred Hitchcock Presents. From 1959 onward, Johnson's work began to regularly appear in magazines such as Playboy, Los Angeles, The Twilight Zone magazine, Rogue, and Gamma, and began to write stories and scripts for TV. I wonder what he's writing for Los Angeles magazine. Yeah. Huh. A trip uh, down to Malibu. Journal, yeah, probably journalism. Yeah. I mean, a lot of guys would moonlight as journalists when they're trying to get their fiction done. Uh, in 1960, he co-wrote The Treatment with Jack Golden Russell for the Rat Pack film Ocean's Eleven. I I'll- grew up in, with a Jack Golden Russell. It was a really cute <laughs> doc. <laughs> <laughs> Although most of the details of the script were changed for the actual film. Uh, through the group, Johnson met Rod Serling. Can we just quickly say how bad Ocean's Eleven, the original, is? Yeah, it's not good. It's such a shame because it's like it's one of those, you know, you want to remember that it was good and love it. And then you watch it and you're like asleep. In it's 15 not minutes. good. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the remake is much better. 
Yeah, definitely. It didn't because it didn't star a bunch of really exhausted <laughs> Vegas performers who would just kind of show up whenever they wanted yeah, to to yeah, yeah. to do the film and then change all the dialogue to suit whatever <laughs> alcoholic, uh, you know, binge bender that they were on. Yeah. After having a number of short stories adapted by others into Twilight Zone episodes, Johnson asked Serling if he could actually write a teleplay for the show. Can you write a teleplay for the show? He begged and pleaded. Uh, He would go on to write for shows like Wanted Dead or Alive, Kung Fu, Route 66, and Star Trek. Very different shows. Uh, He actually wrote the Star Trek episode The Man Trap, which was the first episode ever telecast. Yeah, that's where an alien gets old Kirk in a man trap and marries him. And he's stuck. (laughs) Then he kills her. (laughs) (laughs) Beams away. <laughs> that was close. <laughs> the Logan's Road novel differed from the movie. Uh, it's set in the year 2116. People only live to be 21, and the world isn't a dystopian nightmare. Okay. Uh, Sanctuary is actually an abandoned space station near Mars called Argos. Argos. Uh, the, the book actually ends with him getting in a spaceship and going to the space station. They went to Argos. Yeah. Uh, the book rights were picked up by MGM shortly after being published in 1967. They hired uh, writer Richard Maybaum to adapt the book. Mm. Uh, Maybaum was well known for writing James Bond movies. Right on. Uh, he had writing credits on the first four James Bond films. He received sole writing credit for On Her Majesty's Secret Service in 1969, the George Lazenby movie. George Lazenby, the most underrated James Bond there is. He did an early draft of Diamonds Are Forever in 1971, Connery's quote-unquote final Bond film. Uh, he received sole credit, writing credit for Live and Let Die in 1973, Roger Moore's first Bond movie. Bleep, 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 <laughs> and he rewrote The Man with the Golden Gun in 1974. Nice. Maybaum was also well-known for inserting politics and social issues into his writing. Sneaky. Yeah. He wrote the first anti-lynching play on Broadway, The Tree, in 1932, which was produced when he was 22 and still a student at the University of Iowa. That's really impressive. Yeah. In 1932, that's really impressive. Especially being that he was still in Iowa yeah. and had a Broadway play produced. That's impressive. Right, but also one that dealt with lynching? Yeah, well, yes, yes, yes. He wrote the first anti-Nazi play on Broadway, Birthright, in 1933, the year the Nazis came to power in Germany. Yeah, this guy's prophetic. He, his... <laughs> he was, uh, he saw things immediately. <laughs> I don't like them Nazis. I got something about them Nazis. Yeah. I want to write a play about it. Uh, he co-wrote the first film that dealt with the problem of medication abuse, Bigger Than Life, in 1955, which was released in 1956. I think people are taking too many drugs. Yeah, they don't need them. I'm going to write, write a movie about it. It's going to get worse. And he co-wrote the first film that dealt with the ethical and moral decisions in kidnapping cases, the movie Ransom, in 1955. Yeah, I'm not really, I don't really like when people get kidnapped. I think it's ethically bad. I'm going to write a movie about it. Unfortunately, Maybum and MGM came to loggerheads about the tone of Logan's run. Uh, George Powell and Maybum had competing views of what the film's story should be, including the possibility of incorporating symbolism of real-life issues. Um, hey, guys. <sighs> yeah, yeah, it's Bob. Yeah, my dad worked on this, Bob Sr. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he was like, no, nothing no, too no, deep. No. no politics? He was all... Really, really bad models and boobies. And that was his two. <laughs> and it was his two directives. <laughs> yeah. George Powell. I, I was in the car at the okay. time. Well, sorry, th- sorry, Bob. I forgot you were here. Yeah. Most people do. <laughs> you gotta go. George Powell was a Hungarian animator that eventually produced science fiction and fantasy films. He was nominated for Academy Awards in the category Best Short Subjects Cartoon for seven consecutive years from Damn. 1942 to 1948. And received an honorary award, honorary award in 1944. Nice. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, he turned to producing several science fiction and fantasy films in the 50s and 60s, such as When Worlds Collide. When Worlds Collide! <laughs> four of which were collaborations with director Byron Haskin, including The War of the Worlds in 1953. The War of the Worlds. They're coming. They're coming to get you in New Jersey. <laughs> that was the most unbelievable thing. Yeah. That like the aliens landed, landed in New, New Jersey, Jersey <laughs> out of everywhere in the world. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he himself directed Tom Thumb in 1958, The Time Machine in 1960, nice. and The Wonderful World of the Brothers Grimm in 1962. Uh, rewriting Maybaum's screenplay would have taken between two and three months, and the budget would have to have then been reassessed. Powell became, became concerned that delays would cause the film to miss the wave of success science fiction was enjoying with 2001 A Space Odyssey and Planet of the Apes in 1968. Nice. 
American International Pictures offered to buy PAL's projects, including Logan's run, for $200,000, but MGM declined, only willing to accept a minimum of $350,000. Snobs! Yeah. PAL left the project to produce Doc Savage, the Man of Bronze, in 1975 for Warner Brothers, which was directed by Michael Anderson, who would go on to direct Logan's run. Nice! Yeah. Small world, Hollywood. Yeah, it is. Sometime around this point, Michael Anderson was attached to direct the movie. Anderson was an English film director, best known for directing the World War II film The Dam Busters in 1955. Damn busters! <laughs> Let's bust this dam! Uh, and the epic Around the World in 80 Days in 1956. Oh, it's a good movie. It's a great movie. Dam Busters is really good, too, if you've never seen it. No, I have. It's, it's really fun. I yeah. have. I mean, any Gen X child who watched television in the weekend saw every movie that was ever made yeah yeah yeah, that's true (laughs) anderson then took over a project at mgm originally planned as an alfred hitchcock project the wreck of the mary deer in 1959 gary cooper and charlton heston that sounds cool yeah i've never seen it i I don't know if it's any good but it it who directed it Uh, anderson oh he took over for Yeah. yeah that's a those are big shoes to fill yeah 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 although he was pretty old at the time uh, at 59? No, he was. He still hadn't oh, done Psycho yet. Yeah, okay. yeah. No, he still had. He still had quite a few left in him. Uh, MGM also financed Anderson's next film, the melodrama All the Fine Young Cannibals, in 1960, with Natalie Wood and Robert Wagner. No way! Allegedly, might have had something to do with their death. Yeah, I love that group. By the way, Fine Young Cannibals. Fine Young Cannibals. They're great. Yeah. They drive me. She drives me crazy. <laughs> Like no one else. Oh, that's, 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 sorry, oh, come that's on. all I got. She drives me crazy. Yeah, uh, I love them. They yeah, were also great, they were great. Yeah. So Anderson would direct a series of military and spy thrillers in the '60s before not working for a while in the '70s. Uh, he would end up directing Doc Savage, Man of Bronze, and could Conduct Unbecoming in 1975 for George Pal. Okay. And then uh, Saul David, the producer, assumed responsibility of the project for Logan's Run in 1974. Old Saul David. Yeah. Uh, David started in publishing at Bantam Books before leaving to work for Columbia Pictures and Warner Brothers. Nice. While at Warner, David acquired Helen Gurley Brown's book Sex and the Single Girl for the studio. When one studio executive told him the book had no plot, David replied, I told you that $100,000 ago. The studio had purchased a title, not a plot. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a provocative title. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. They could make any kind of movie about it. Right, right. Starring Natalie Wood. Exactly. It doesn't matter. He became a producer at 20th Century Fox with the 1964 World War II Prisoner of War adventure Von Ryan's Express, filmed on location in Italy with Frank Sinatra and a very strong cast. It's a good movie. Yeah. Uh, he then produced three Spy Five films, Our Man Flint in 1965. Oh, James Coburn, baby. Yeah. Fantastic Voyage in 1966, which I love that movie. Oh, yeah. And, Kelly Savalas, baby. And the Our Man Flint sequel, In Like Flint, in 1967. I have the soundtrack to... You do? Uh, on original is soundtrack it Man, on Or is it Our Man Flint or In Like Flint? I don't remember. In Like Flint. Oh, it is In Like Flint. It's a sequel. Yeah. yeah. It's nice. It's such a great groovy uh, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Soundtrack. Soundtracks are great. Yeah. Uh, all four of those films were big commercial successes. The plot of In Like Flint concerns three minutes missing from the life of the President of the United States. Oh, it's just one of those swinging, sexy 60s, yeah. you know, spy movies. And it's got the skinny karate James Coburn. It's can't, yeah. can't ask for anything more. It's lovely ladies. Uh, ironically, when Fox edited out three minutes of In Like Flint to add more depth to the film, David left the studio. Womp, womp. This became an ongoing thing with him. Uh, years later, David was enraged by seeing 10 to 15 minutes cut from an R. Man Flint television broadcast to that. It's not so much re-edited, it's lobotomized into senselessness. So he wrote to California Senator George Murphy to say that since a publisher is required to inform readers if they are buying and reading abridged works, so should television stations inform their viewers they are watching abridged films. Got a point. He is literally the reason why your TV says this has been modified from its original version. Edited for content and time. David hired Soylent Green author Stanley R. Greenberg to rewrite the screenplay for Logan's Run. Soylent Green is people! Uh, Greenberg actually devised the idea of Carousel, but afterwards dropped off the project. Do you think he's the one that snuck in the eaten peeps in, uh, in Logan's Run? Yeah, probably. We'll I put mean, a little Easter egg for <clears throat> oh, Soylent Green in there. Po- yeah, quite possibly. You know what else is people? <laughs> Logan's Run! <laughs> David then hired David Zalag Goodman. Goodman was nominated for an Academy Award for Lovers and Other Strangers in 1970, but lost to MASH. Oh. He co-wrote with Sam Peckinpah the screenplay for 1971's controversial Straw Dogs. Brutal movie. Yeah, it's such a good movie. He was often sought as a quote-unquote script doctor because he could quickly identify screenplay flaws, as when Sherry Lansing brought him in to work on the thriller Fatal Attraction. 
I won't be ignored, Dan. According to his friend, the film and television producer Zev Braun, Goodman said to Lansing of the Glenn Close character, You can't let her off the hook. You should kill her. Let's drown her. There you go. All right. Goodman wrote a nearly completely new screenplay for Logan's Run, raising the age of death from 21 to 30 to allow for more actors to be considered for casting. Yeah, they should have made it to 40. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus. So true. There's so many people that look so old in the movie. Oh, my God, yeah. Uh, so casting, Michael York was cast as Logan Five. Logan Five. Yeah. Um, I'm Logan Five. I'm a, a um, what do you call it? A Sandman? <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, Logan was originally intended to be played by John Voight before going to Michael York. Okay. I. Well, they basically got John Voight with Richard Jordan. I yeah. mean, let's be honest. Yeah. He's a yeah. more emotive John Voight. <laughs> Those eyes. <laughs> God, the end, he's just... Oh, anyway. Uh, Michael made his West End debut in London at the age of 17, a production of Hamlet. Mm. After performing on stage with the Royal National Theatre, he had a breakthrough in films by playing Tybalt in Franco Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet in 1968. Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> his blonde, blue-eyed, boyish looks and English upper social class demeanor saw him play leading roles in several major British and Hollywood films in the 1970s. His best-known roles include Conrad Ludwig in Something for Everyone in 1970, a black comedy co-starring Angela Lansbury. Nice. I always forget she's British. Yeah. Uh, Jeffrey Richter Douglas in Zeppelin in 1971, which depicts a fictitious attempt to raid Britain in a German Zeppelin to steal the Magna Carta from its hiding place in one of Scotland's castles or destroy it. Yeah, it's a super simple plot. (laughs) That old thing. (laughs) Brian Roberts in Cabaret in 1972, co-starring Liza Minnelli and written and directed by Bob Fosse. Yeah, that was a juggernaut. It was huge. George Conway in Lost Horizon in 1973, a musical fantasy adventure, also starring Peter Finch, Liv Ullman, Sally Kellerman, George Kennedy, Olivia Hussey, Bobby Van, James Shigeta, Charles Boyer, and John Gielgud. That is commonly listed as one of the 50 worst movies of all yeah, time. Yeah. It's Charles Boyer, but no. um, yes. well, you, you should know that, Adam. <laughs> such a, yeah, Charles Boyer. He's very popular. Actor. Yeah. Have you ever seen it? No, I've never seen Lost Horizon. Yeah. I don't know if I have. It sounds super familiar. If it was made in the 70s, I'm sure I saw it at some point in my life. Yeah. I I want to say the title sounds familiar, but I think it sounds familiar in association with the fact that it's usually hated. <laughs> I, I, I think that, like, because they made jokes about, like, puns off the name, like Lost Horizon, like they did with, like, Heaven's Gate and stuff like that. Right, like, right. Yeah. So he would play D'Artagnan in The Three Musketeers in 1973 and its two sequels. Oh, he was absolutely spectacular. Yeah. he That is my absolute favorite adaptation of the three musketeers probably because i saw it as a kid yeah and it got me into it but i think more so than any other adaptation especially the modern ones when they come at it it, whatever era right that we're in they have to make some stylized version of the three musketeers within that era of cinema whether it's the 90s (laughs) or the aughts yeah they they always try it with like quick cuts or whatever or like oh we're gonna make them all okay (laughs) the one with michael york is much more true to the actual book. More spot on. Which is one of my favorite books of all time. One of my favorite classics of all time, definitely. I I really thought that your favorite version of it would have been the 90s version with Charlie Sheen. Yes. And uh, I don't even remember the other two. Oh, didn't it? Wasn't Don't Tanyan, wasn't it played by uh, Chris... The, the kid that played Robin, Chris uh, O'Donnell. Oh, I think you're right. Yeah, Is that his name? I think you're right. Chris O'Donnell. Yeah, yeah. he was like D'Artagnan. Yeah, and, and, and Charlie uh, Sheen and then... Uh, and uh, Oliver Platt. Yeah, yes. Actually, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I actually did... I, I like that movie. Yeah. But uh, but I need to watch the Michael York version again. I, I've not seen it. Oh, uh, we'll do... We're definitely doing yeah. a show on that because that just like... Because I'd always loved the book and it's just that was... Had such a great... Oliver Reed was so good. Yeah, yeah. The guys that played the Musketeers were funny and good. It almost had like a a tiny bit of uh, Monty Python kind of oh, jammed really? in it a little bit with the humor. Yeah, because it was funny and weird, but also sad. And like it, just like yeah. the book, you know? Yeah. That's cool. I yeah. like that. That sounds fun. Yeah. Right. But that's what got me uh, hooked on Michael York. Oh, was yeah. was watching that, and then yeah. I would watch anything he did. He also played Count Andrani in Murder on the Orient Express in 1974. Uh, Michael York was 33 when he filmed Logan's Run. Oh, no. <laughs> he would not technically be alive. Um, excuse me. My light's flashing again <laughs> because I'm 33. In his later career, he found success as Basil Exposition in the Austin Powers film series. Hello, Austin. Basil Exposition here. 
He was so good. That was my first real realiz- realization who he was. He's so funny. Yeah. He's just so great. He's just one of those guys you could tell he comes from the theater. Yeah. Because yeah. he's got that vibe to him. But yeah. not in a bad way. Like no, no, Richard no, no, no. Burton, him. You know, there's all these guys that came from the theater that it's more of like a swagger than it yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. Like old, like more newer theater people that right, just right. seem like really annoying because they're all method. Yeah. Um, he just seems like a guy that paid his dues and knows, you know, it'd be like, all yeah. right, Michael, I need you. Yeah, I'm, I understand well, that. It yeah. seems like he really and knew what he was doing was special and that he had fun doing it. Except, just like, you know, he did not know how to hold or fire a, <laughs> a firearm. He, he, it's like he was holding a banana. <laughs> It was, it was super weird. Like a hot potato or something is just. Didn't, I don't. They probably didn't pay anybody to teach him how to use it. So. I've never held a firearm in my life. <laughs> it shows, Michael. <laughs> <sighs> uh, he would also start making TV appearances in shows like Curb Your Enthusiasm and Law and Order: Criminal Intent, and he lent his voice to Star Wars: Clone Wars. Yeah, I remember him in Clone Wars. God, I'm so glad that he I've got to act so long that he is. Yeah. He did. Yeah. Uh, he would be nominated for an Emmy twice for the ABC After School special "Are You My Mother" in 1986 and the AMC series "The Lot" in 2001. He just kept knocking on doors. Are you my mother? <laughs> I'm younger than you, buddy. This is worthy of an Emmy. <laughs> yeah, look at him. York met photographer Patricia McCallum in 1967 when she was assigned to photograph him, and they married on March 27th, 1968. Nice. His 26th birthday. His her st- sorry his stepson is Star Wars producer Rick McCallum. Great, very nice guy. Yeah, I had I, d- I didn't realize that that connection was there. So neurotic. Oh really? Well, because I mean he had to do all the work. Yeah, yeah. That George Lucas didn't want to do, so <laughs> he was pretty stressed out. Yeah. His last film role was voiceover as the narrator for the 2014 Sleeping Beauty, directed by Casper Van Dien. Not a good way to go out. Uh, York announced he was suffering from the rare disease called amblyodosis in 2013. Uh, doctors initially thought he had bone cancer. Good Lord. He underwent a stem cell transplant, which can alleviate symptoms in 2012. In 2022, in order to be closer to the Mayo Clinic Hospital for treatment, York and his wife moved to Rochester, Minnesota. Oh. Uh, he's still around. He's still fighting it. Uh, well, good. He just but... hasn't done any acting in 10 uh, years. Uh, so why, why are you punishing me by making me yeah. move to Minnesota? <laughs> <laughs> He needs the treatment. Well, I'm glad Um, he's getting treatment because he is awesome. I'd love to see him back doing anything. He's got such a distinctive voice. William Devane was originally cast to play Francis Seven, but withdrew from the project to replace Roy Thins in Alfred Alfred Hitchcock's 1976 film Family Plot. Wasn't that his last film? Yes, it was. Yeah, wasn't very good. No, it it was okay, but it was like trying to be a comedy, and then it kind of wasn't. Ironically... (laughs) The family plot could have used a little more plot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and a little less family. Uh, Jordan, Jordan is best known for his performances in Lawman in 1971, his film debut, co-starring Burt Lancaster and Robert Duvall. Could you imagine? I'm a lawman. Hey, lawman. It's just, just a lot of... It's just, just, the, oh. yeah. it's just a lot of screaming and, and, and clenching of teeth. A lot of sweat dripping. <laughs> Uh, he was in Chato's Land in 1972. Yeah, he was. Co-starring Charles Bronson and Jack Palance. Yeah, another, Pally. Another Western. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Rooster Cogburn in 1975, starring John Wayne and Catherine Hepburn. You old poop. That was a pretty good... <laughs> I don't think she said that. In yeah, the oh, she did, too. Ah, you're, you're a nasty you old, old man. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, lady. I'm going to knock you on your behind. Well, there you go. Now we don't have to watch Rooster Cogburn. Oh, no, now we're friends. And We're best friends. Richard Jordan's in the back going, Argh! I don't like friendship. <laughs> well, too late, buddy. Pilgrim. Uh, he was also known for the 1976 TV miniseries Captains and the Kings, for which he was nominated for a Golden Globe. Nice. After Logan's run, he starred in David Lynch's Dune in 1984, uh, playing Duncan Idaho. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Duncan Idaho. That's the name yeah. that I couldn't remember uh, that uh, Jason, Jason Momoa, Momoa plays. Yeah. In the, it, it, Flies in from another movie. I read a whole article about Duncan Idaho because I thought they made him up for the movie. No. He's in the book. Yes. And in fact, he's the only character to appear in all six of the original novels. Of course, because he's Duncan Idaho, Adam. (laughs) Of course he does. (laughs) I'm a cowboy. (laughs) Duncan Uh, Idaho. (laughs) Richard Jordan was in Solar Babies in uh, 1986. Hey, Solar Babies, we're going to get you home. Wasn't that the, like... Kids that were yeah. in a space station or something. Yeah, they yeah they it, they were going up for some reason and they get stuck up there and it's they like have to come camp. Back down. I don't yeah. Know. yeah. 
Uh, ten episodes of the Equalizer TV show in 1987. Great show. And The Hunt for Red October in 1990 and Gettysburg in 1993. Nice. By 1993, his health began to fail and he was diagnosed with a brain tumor. No. Uh, cast as Dr. Charles Nichols, he was filming The Fugitive in April 1993 when his illness forced him to withdraw. Oh. Uh, he died on August 30th, 1993 at the age of 56, cared for by his daughter Nina and his companion, Marsha Cross. Oh, Marsha Cross. Yeah. A memorial in Jordan's honor was held at the Mark Taper Forum in Los Angeles on October 8th, 1993, the day Gettysburg was released. God damn, he was young. Yeah, that's sad. That really sucks. That is really sad, because he was a really great bad guy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And just one of those awesome character actors that just was a fixture of the 70s and 80s. Yeah. 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 It, it was really... Yeah. He was taken too soon. Too soon. Too soon. Jenny Gutter was cast as Jessica Six. Is that her name, Gutter? I think so. Or is it Aguter? No. She's British. <laughs> yeah, Jenny Agutter. Man, what a horrible name to grow up with, by the way. Oh, it's Jenny. Jenny Agutter girl <laughs> from the Qatar. <laughs> So she began her career as a 12-year-old child actress in 1964, appearing in East of Sudan, Star, starring Julie Andrews in 1968, and two adaptations of The Railway Children, the BBC's 1968 television serial and the 1970 film version. Nice. Uh, 1971, she also starred in the critically acclaimed film Walkabout, directed by Nicholas Rogue. That included a five-minute skinny-dipping scene that was cut for U.S. audiences. Uh, she was 16 at the time. Scandalous. Scandalous, yes. And she was in the TV film The Snow Goose about the Dunkirk evacuation, for which she won an Emmy Award for Outstanding Supporting Actress in a Drama. Excellent. In 1974, she moved to L.A. Good call, Jennifer. <laughs> in addition to appearing in Logan's Run in 1976, she also appeared in The Eagle Has Landed, the final film from acclaimed director John Sturgis, starring Michael Caine, Donald Sutherland, and Robert Duvall. Michael Caine. In 1977, she appeared in Equus, directed by Sidney Lumet, starring Richard Burton. Richard Burton! Uh, I'm in Equus! <laughs> I'm going to... I'm going to blind these horses and drink. Uh, she won a BAFTA for Best Supporting Actress for the, her role in the, in the film. Yeah, well, she had to keep her own with Richard Burton. Richard Burton, yeah. Good old Dickie Burton. Dickie Burton. Uh, in 1981, she appeared in An American Werewolf in London, directed by John Landis. Oh, such a great movie. Uh, which is what I remember her from. That mm -hmm. was, that's the whole time she's on screen. I was like, oh, man. And yeah. Then, yeah. It's American Werewolf. In 1990, she returned to the UK to concentrate on family life, and her focus shifted towards British television. She made a guest appearances in shows like Red Dwarf, a uh, very underrated comedy. In 2000, she starred in a third adaptation of The Railway Children, this time playing the mother. Fine, I'll do it again, but this time I want to play the mother. In 2012, she resumed her Hollywood career, appearing as a member of the World Security Council. Council? Council? Council. The World Security Council in the movie The Avengers. Uh, she also reprised the role in Captain America the Winter Soldier in 2014. Nice. Uh, since 2012, she has played sister Julianne in the BBC television drama series Call the Midwife. Okay. Isn't that your favorite show? Yeah, I'm always saying, Call the Midwife! In 2022... This baby's coming! In 2022, she starred in the sequel, The Railway Children Return, reprising her role from the 1970 film. Yes, I'll do it, but I want to play my role that I did in 1970. Yeah, I, it's, she's been in this like four times now. <sighs> Whatever you want. Yeah. Just, we can't make it without you. <laughs> Roscoe Lee Brown was cast as Box. Box, yes. Ugh, that was so gross because <laughs> you could see... His mouth and teeth inside of the head. They yeah, didn't do a very good a little, job. Yeah. They really should have used a puppet head and not his head. And not had him inside of it? No, that seems cruel. It's super weird. And it just, it was Uncanny Valley when he would open up his mouth and you're like, are those human teeth in a mouth? What is Box? Also, it's a little weird that literally the only black guy in the movie is a robot. Yeah. Yeah, like what's up with that? By the there way, there is literally no nobody but white people in that in that city. Huh. <laughs> I did not notice that. But yes, what a horrible future. <laughs> Brown bucked the stereotypical roles that a black man was offered by winning the part of Pindarus in Julius Caesar during New York City's first Shakespeare Festival in 1956. Nice. He's. His first film role came in 1961 as an off-screen voice in 1961's *The Connection*, an early experimental found footage film. Uh, okay. He played a cameraman that was right off screen. Hey, uh, what's going on over there? Uh, he also had a poetry performance tour, including uh, directing an evening of Negro poetry and folk music in 1966. Nice. He would continuously appear in film and TV, including That Was the Week That Was, the satirical news show in 1964. Cool. Uh, the Cowboys in 1972, starring John Wayne and Bruce Dern. That was a good one. 
1976, Brown was nominated for an Emmy Award for Outstanding Single Performance by a Supporting Actor in a Comedy or Drama Series for his work on ABC's Barney Miller. Oh, Barney Miller. Oh, Barney Miller. That was a great show. Had Fish and Wojohovitz or Wojoho, Wojo. Wojo Wojovitz? Yeah, they called him Wojo. Oh, yeah, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. Fish. Yeah. That was uh, Abe Vigoda. Yeah. And he got his own show, a spinoff called Fish. Fish. I think so. <laughs> Did Wojo get his own show called no. Wojo? It was called No No Joe no, no Show for Wojo. <laughs> That's what they kept telling him. Can I have a spinoff show like Fish? No show for Wojo. Oh. Oh, it's not funny anymore. <laughs> Brown not only provided the voice of Box, the robot, as we said, he also performed him on set, as was very obvious from the weirdness. Ugh, it just didn't work. Uh, the unwieldy costume made it impossible for Brown to write himself if he fell over. Which apparently happened a few times. Yeah, because it's the worst. And it was like, I think he had, it was like a treadmill that he was walking, but then it oh. kind of wasn't. Like he would wobble when he walked. It was super weird. No more things from the show. No thing, no more things from the sea. So now people eat people. <laughs> it's people. I don't know what you guys eat. But it's people. <laughs> After Logan's run in 1977, Brown narrated a record album, The Story of Star Wars, which presented an abridged version of the events depicted in the first released film using the dialogue and sound effects. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Uh, the recording was produced by George Lucas and Alan Livingston. Uh, also in 77, he was inducted into the Black Filmmakers Hall of Fame. Nice. He, he may be best known for his role on Soap from 79 to 81, playing the butler. One of them. Okay. Because I think, wasn't Robert Guillaume, didn't he start on soap as well? Benson was also uh, on there. They had a lot of African-American butlers, apparently. Uh, apparently they did on soap. It was a trope. The soap trope. That's what they call it. <laughs> in 1986, he won the Emmy Award for Outstanding Guest Performer in a Comedy Series for his work on NBC's The Cosby Show. Uh, <laughs> in 1992, he received a Tony Award nomination for Best Featured Actor in a Play for his performance as Holloway in August Wilson's Two Trains Running. Nice. In 1985, he received a Daytime Emmy Award nomination for Outstanding Performer in an Animated Program for his appearance, or his performance, as the Kingpin in the animated series Spider-Man. Spider-Man, I'm the Kingpin. I'm going to crush you. Uh, he came really close to doing the EGOT, but it, he was nominated for stuff, but it never happened. Uh, Brown died of stomach cancer at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles on the morning of April 11th, 2007, at the age of 84. <sighs> what a rough way to go. Yeah. He never married and had no children. Boom. Just like me. I'm a Roscoe Lee Brown. You are. Yeah. Stick you in a box. <laughs> Wait. What? That <laughs> sounds like I'm going to die. <laughs> uh, Farrah Fawcett Majors was cast as Holly 13. Yeah, married to Lee Majors. Yeah, uh, that's my wife. That's my ex-wife. I mean, I got to be honest, watching her performance in this, I don't know how she ever worked ever again. Because she was gorgeous. And she had that hair. She was so bad. Adam, it didn't matter. That right scene, then. that was the only scene I literally turned to you and go, this could have been 30 seconds long. It was so long. But you were, but he was over the, but you said that he, and then he put on, no, but you did the, and then You could literally the, see the cookie cutter of the two shot, close up, close up, two shot, close up, close up, two shot. Granted, the dialogue wasn't great that she was given. Her eyes were doing good work. <laughs> sure. <laughs> she, <laughs> she, we also, man, if you want to see a really, really bad Farrah Fawcett major's performance, watch Saturn 3. With oh, Kirk yeah. Douglas. Oh, Kirk yeah. Douglas. Yeah. Uh, so Fawcett began her career in the 1960s, appearing in commercials and guest roles on television. During the 1970s, she appeared in numerous television series, including recurring roles on Harry O, starring David Jansen from 74 to 76. Harry O, he was a, uh, Harry O was a, um, uh, gigolo who was known. Oh, okay. <laughs> for giving the O. Oh, oh. Which was rare at the time because right. men didn't really pleasure women. Oh, all right. Yeah, David Jansen. He had ears that stuck out. Oh, they grabbed those ears. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> she was also on The Six Million Dollar Man from 74 to 78 with her then husband, film and television star Lee Majors. Yes, she, yes, she was. Hey, there's a lot of tension between us. Because oh. I was a Six Million Dollar Man and she was just a nurse. <laughs> Her iconic red swimsuit poster sold 6 million copies in its first year in print. Bing! I bought one. <laughs> Fawcett's breakthrough role was with, was as private investigator Jill Monroe in Charlie's Angels, which co-starred Kate Jackson and Jacqueline Smith. Yep. After appearing in the show's first season in 76, Fawcett decided to leave Charlie's Angels. Bad move, lady. Yeah, I know. It was another one of those too big for your britches that yeah. they always come back. Like, what's that redheaded weirdo? 
that uh, that did that was in CSI. Oh, uh, he was too big for TV, yeah. and then he did like three really bad movies I and went back I'm for not TV. His name. Exactly, I don't exactly. Name. Yeah. Uh, she later returned as a guest star in six episodes during the show's third and fourth seasons. She received her first Golden Globe nomination for her part in Charlie's Angels. Yeah. Jill Monroe is a very complex character, Adam. <laughs> sure. Michael York was playing tennis and saw what he described as a... Blonde vision of light. It turned out to be Farrah Fawcett. Oh, hello. Uh, so hey, that's my wife, pal. You stay away. <laughs> he's... I'll show the $6 million man. York suggested her to the casting director, and she subsequently landed the role of Holly. Sorry, I didn't press off on the <laughs> recording that I had of when they met. At sure, the place. sure, right, right. It's weird that you have that. I have so many. Paid a weird, lot of money for yeah. that, didn't you? It's, yeah, I collect odd recordings. <laughs> odd recordings yes. of seventies, just so I can play them on the show. It's yeah, a, by, by it's my good. Own expense. It's good. I spent no expense, Adam. I spent no expense. Uh, Fawcett has been nominated four times for the Primetime Emmy Award and six times for the Golden Globes, most of them coming later in her career. She got good. Uh, she sure. did when she she did some work with Robert Altman that was really good. Yeah, and the turning point in her career was The Burning Bed. Yeah, which was uh, a movie about a woman being abused. Oh yeah, by her husband, and then he she ends up lighting Murdering him on fire. Him. Oh wow, wow! Uh, while he was in bed, hence the burning bed, ah. and then going on trial. But it was like one of the first. It was originally a play. Yeah, um, and uh, that's what turned her from jiggle, you know. Yeah, bimbo girl. To not be my serious. words. Sure, sure. But sure, uh, sure. to you know, more of a serious actress because oh. she really wanted to take her craft seriously, and she, she did. really did yeah. get good. Yeah. You know. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, obviously she did. She just it was a very inauspicious start right. in Logan's run. Well, when you're that beautiful, then you don't really have to worry about it. But right. she decided, right. you know, as she was getting older, and she wasn't like you know, old and no, un, you know, she, she was, was still beautiful, very beautiful until the day yeah. she died. Yeah, but she made the pivot. Right, right. Uh, so, into well, deeper, more meaty right. roles, less like sexy roles. Yeah. Because, you know, she wanted to have longevity and, and she wanted to stretch yeah, as, yeah. A, as an artist. After getting involved with Brian O'Neill, he introduced her to Andy Warhol in 1980, who painted two portraits of her. Oh. The paintings are valued at around $12 million. Let's get one. Uh, into the, <laughs> sure. In 2006, she announced that she was diagnosed with anal cancer, but through chemotherapy was announced cancer-free in 2007. Awesome. Ugh, what an awful... I mean, so many people having cancer, stomach cancer, anal cancer, pancreas cancer. These are like the... The nasty, nasty ones. Jeez. Uh, Unfortunately, a few months later, it was discovered that the cancer had metastasized to her liver. After battling the cancer with aggressive and alternative methods, she succumbed on June 25th, 2009. How old was she? She had to be, what, in her 50s? Yeah, she was like 56, I think, or something. Just so young. Mm, Yeah, something like that. Uh, Michael Anderson Jr. was cast as Doc... Doc. Doc. Uh, Anderson grew up wanting to act in his father's films. Uh, okay. He obviously is Michael Anderson uh, Jr. He's His dad directed the movie. Uh, he would not work with his father until Logan's run. He actually had a pretty good career before that. Uh, he studied drama and ballet at arts educational schools, London, and by the age of eight began performing on live radio and television shows. Oh. He also danced with the London Festival Ballet. Good for him. Uh, Anderson's first major American film was The Sundowners in 1960, starring Deborah Kerr. Deborah Kerr? Deborah Carr. Carr? Yeah. I've never pronounced it that way. Starring Deborah Carr. In 1962, he was cast as John Glenn Narvin in the Walt Disney film In Search of the Castaways. <laughs> John Glenn Narvin! <laughs> Starring Maurice Chevalier and Haley Mills. Nice. For one season in 1966, Anderson played 18-year-old Clayt Monroe, one of five orphan siblings in the ABC Western series The Monroes. Okay. Uh, before the series uh, filming began, it was reported that Anderson... Spent five months getting rid of his English accent. He made an appearance in the 1974 TV movie Evil Knievel. <laughs> yeah, he did. He would appear in the TV miniseries The Martian Chronicles in 1980. Oh, man. That, do you remember? Remember that? You're pretty young. The but that Martian was Chronicles? such a huge, like, deal when it came out. The Martian Chronicles? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. I totally, I know. Yeah. That I love like, the book. So, like, I made sure. I mean, I didn't see it. Was that Bradbury? It, yeah. Yeah. I didn't see it when it came out in 1980, but I've definitely watched it. I love that book, too, and I was so pumped for that miniseries. And I yeah. think it was pretty good. I don't remember. Yeah, Darren McGavin in it. It was. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was good. I, I mean, it was. The third part was kind of long and unnecessary, but the first two were really good. <laughs> yes. 
Uh, one of the episodes was directed by his father, and he would make guest appearances in shows like Fantasy Island, Chips, and Highway to Heaven. That pain! That pain! <laughs> in, uh, on December 12, 1988, Anderson became a naturalized U.S. citizen and retired from acting in 1998 at the age of 55. I'm done. Now that I'm an American citizen, I'm just going to eat hot dogs, nachos, and watch baseball and football. Yeah, I don't, he's, I don't even know what he's doing. I tried to find information on what he's doing. but Probably he's, just living life, baby. He's got to be in his 80s now. Well, 98. Yeah. It was in his late 70s. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Peter Ustinov was cast as the old man. Oh, yes. Oh, 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 yeah, don't, don't touch me on my wrinkles. <laughs> he had the weirdest hands. The hands were so bizarre. My big red hands. Let me touch him. <laughs> he was old. I know. Well, yeah. Uh, he was a learned man. He spoke English, French, Spanish, Italian, German, and Russian fluently. Jesus. As well as some Turkish and modern Greek. From the start of his career, he made guest appearances on talk shows and game shows, becoming becoming a staple on late night and daytime. Yeah, because he was so interesting. Peter right. used right. to know. Yeah, this yeah. is such a big boy. I mean, they gave him such a weird accent in this. Yeah, I know. But he, you know, yeah. usually it was Peter used to know. And they'd yeah. always have him uh, narrate stuff, and he would just come on and tell these amazing stories. Yeah, he was Yeah, yeah. In addition to acting, he started directing at an early age. He appeared in hundreds of movies, TV shows, and plays, as well as writing novels, novellas, and plays. He was considered what they call a renaissance man. Yes, I did everything, and I did it well. It pissed everybody off. He's been nominated for an Academy Award four times, uh, nominated in 1952 uh, as Best Supporting Actor for Quo Vadis. He won in 1961 Best Supporting Actor for Spartacus. I am Spartacus. <laughs> In 1965, he won as well for Best Supporting Actor for Top Copy. Top Copy! In 1969, he was nominated for Best Original Screenplay, uh, Hot Millions with Ira Wallach. Mm. Uh, which is interesting. I mean, it makes sense. He's a Renaissance man. Yeah, he is. He was nominated five times for an Emmy in 1958. He won Best Single Performance by a Leading or Supporting Actor for Omnibus, The Life of Samuel Johnson. Uh, in 1967, he won the Emmy for Outstanding Single Performance by an Actor in a Leading Role for Barefoot in Athens. 1970, he won as well Outstanding Single Performance by an Actor in a Leading Role for A Storm in Summer. Nice. He was nominated in 1982, uh, Outstanding Individual Achievement in Informational Programming for Omni, The New Frontier. Yeah. Doing that voiceover, yeah. In 1985, he was nominated Outstanding Classical Program in the Performing Arts for The Well-Tempered Bach with Peter Ustinov. Welcome to Well-Tempered Bach with Peter Ustinov. He was nominated four times for a Grammy. Good Lord. He won in 1960 for Best Recording for Children, the pro Kiev uh, Peter and the Wolf with the Philharmonic Orchestra. I must have listened to that record a thousand times yeah. as a child. In 1974, he was nominated for Best Recording for Children for The Little Prince. And that one. In <laughs> uh, 1978, he was nominated for Best Recording for Children, Russell Hoban and The Mouse and His Child. Nope. Didn't in listen to that one. 1981, he was nominated for Best Spoken Word Album a, called A Curb in the Sky. Uh, although he did, so he did win. He's won all of them except for the Tony, which he was nominated for twice and was robbed of the EGOT. Jerks. Yeah. Uh, he also received 13 honorary degrees over his lifetime. Uh, just, uh, no more, please. <laughs> really, I have no room for these on my wall. Uh, there is so much more about Peter Ustinov, but we'll cover him in another episode uh, because he had a fascinating life. Oh, yeah. Uh, he passed in 2004 from heart failure at the age of 82. No. Uh, so if he was 82 in 2004, then yeah, he would have been in his like fifties when he was playing the old man. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Although they did obviously make him up quite a bit. <laughs> yes. Not good makeup. Not good. Uh, Randolph Roberts was cast as the second sanctuary man. I, I, the only reason I included him was because he played the older brother Chuck on happy days for a few episodes. Yeah. That was one of the weirdest things. Randolph Roberts, at the beginning of Happy Days, played Chuck. And they would be like, hey, Chuck. You know, Chuck would come in. He was always, always bouncing a basketball. Chuck was a jock, a basketball player. Then Chuck just <laughs> disappeared. Stopped being mentioned. and <laughs> Chuck, He just wasn't around yeah, anymore? Chuck, something weird. happened to Chuck. Chuck is like oh. the weird family secret of the cutting hands. Dun, dun, dun. Whatever happened to Chuck? <laughs> Tonight on Dateline. <laughs> We find out what happened to Chuck. Were the Cunninghams harboring a secret? Or did he just disappear? Oh, that pesky DNA. <laughs> oh, that pesky <laughs> DNA. Uh, I also do, I didn't put this in the script, but I realized while we were watching it that uh, Gary Morgan is in this movie, who was a stuntman uh, who had some lines. But I've actually been to his house. Uh, yeah. 
uh, for some party. I, I worked with his daughter. He was in a lot of stuff. He was, too. Yes, yes, he, he was, was a big character. Stuff, yeah. And don't forget Michelle Stacy. Yes, who played the uh, dirty young, little girl, the, the young girl who eventually played. <laughs> she stole. <laughs> it's so sad. The dirty little girl who just kind of, I guess, lives in the yeah. outskirts by yeah. herself. She steals. She doesn't go back in. She steals Agutters, uh, yeah. uh, or Jenny Six, Jessica, Jessica Six, Six um, steals her bracelet, and then before Jessica Six leaves the gross area, she finds her and just takes the bracelet back, <laughs> and just leaves. <laughs> I mean, I was waiting for her to be like, yeah. put the bracelet back on her, being like, "You keep this, little yeah, girl." No, nope, 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 no, no, no rewards for thieves. Uh, but Michelle, Michelle Stacy, is that her name? Yes, she she ended up being the girl who was drinking coffee in an airplane. airplane. The little girl who. What do you like, cream or sugar? I take my coffee like I I like my coffee like I like my men, black. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> uh, anyway, so they shot a lot of interiors in Fort Worth, Texas, saving the productions upwards of $3 million. Uh, there was a bunch of, like, uh, hotels and convention centers and stuff they shot in Fort Worth. Oh, you could tell, though. It's yeah. just... It's, well, the, the mall. Yeah. There literally was a mall they just dressed yeah, in. And yeah, and it looked like it was a, a, a like a nice hotel or something. Yeah. Because you could see all the... It's like, did it... Did everybody live at the? It, it looked like what's that hotel downtown with the glass elevators? The uh, no, I don't remember what it's called. The be, the, I was the, say the Billingham Belvedere. No. no, the um, Biltmore. Biltmore. It's like it looks like the Biltmore. Yeah, yeah. I do also think it's really funny that three hundred years in the future they've perfected how to grow people, yet they still have escalators. No. <laughs> <laughs> if it ain't broke, Adam. <laughs> eh, eh. Uh, they also used a bunch of decrepit sets from the failing MGM Studios lot. Uh, nine entire sound stages were used at MGM in Culver City, California, hosting a miniature city amongst largest of its kind built to date. They really should have undercranked those yes. scenes because nothing gives away models more than water. Yeah, yeah. That was the first thing I thought of when they were zooming in. I was like, man. Water looks too... Those waves would be like 18 feet tall. Like, or it just like, sense. crank it down and yeah, get the yeah. water going a little bit just to yeah. give you, you know, a little bit of realism. It just, it it was too clean. It looked, they needed, to, I get it. It was like the, the future was completely perfect because of sure, this computer, sure. but, you know, yeah, yeah. come on. It's still, yeah. It, it's something that they should have known. Uh, it became the first film to use Dolby Stereo on 70 millimeter prints. Sound was really good. It was advertised as six channel audio, but actually only used four, not using the two subwoofer channels. Liars. Uh, Star Wars and Close Encounters of the Third Kind were the first to use them in 1977. Nice. Post production took eight months, including completion of the score. The score was composed and conducted by Jerry Goldsmith with orchestrations by Arthur Morton. It's so odd to me that that's a Jerry Goldsmith score. It's super weird. It's such a cool, weird... It's like So a, much of it, the beginning, that first two-thirds, is so weirdly sci-fi, and then he goes a little more stringy. And yeah. Like, but once, like... Once we get to the third act, yeah, once we get yeah. out of the... Out sanc- of the we, when we're looking for sanctuary. Yeah. But it's all like... It's super weird. And it comes out... And <laughs> it totally startles like, you, too. What? Because all of a sudden... No, no, but like, the, the electronic sounds. <laughs> it was just super weird. But yeah, I, I had no idea that was Jerry Goldsmith. Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, the score... Adheres to two distinct sound palettes. Strings, keyboards, and abstract electronics. Only for cues inside the city and full orchestra for outside. He yeah. was a genius. He knew what he was doing. Yeah, exactly. That's like the best part of the whole film. <laughs> the film was previewed for test audiences prior to its release. A few sequences were edited or shortened as a result. These included a longer sequence in the ice cave where Box asked Logan and Jessica to pose for his ice sculpture. Yeah, would you? I see you've taken off your clothes for no reason. Would you mind posing for me? Mm, <laughs> this look at was... my penguins. <laughs> This was cut due to extensive nudity so that the film could receive a PG rating as PG-13 didn't exist yet, and it was cut for length. Ah, the robot was a creep. He was a little pervy creep. But so was Michael York, who literally, uh, yes. bef- right before that, we should go, oh, there's furs. Let's oh, get these furs. Yes. First, take off your clothes because they're frozen. I, why aren't you taking off your pants? And, and they're not frozen. I don't like your underpants. <laughs> my, my loins are hot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, other scenes were removed, including a sequence where Francis hunts down a runner by himself at the beginning of the film. Okay. A, quote, knockdown, drag out fight. Unquote, scene between Jessica and Holly 13 was shortened, already having been shortened by Michael Anderson during filming, as the ladies actually started pulling each other's hair. Yeah, that... That was a, it just kind of happened in the background. It was like suddenly she tackles her. That was yeah. it. It was like, oh, okay. Uh, at the end of the process, the budget had escalated from the projected $3 million to $9 million in ex- very expensive film for 1976. Oh, yeah. I mean, Star Wars was only $3 million. Yeah. Uh, it was noted for being the most expensive MGM film made in 10 years, with most of the budget going to the sets. <laughs> Certainly didn't go to the effects. Uh, in the first five days in theaters in 1976, Logan's run grossed $2.5 million. Not bad. The film finished its run with a gross of $25 million in North America. All right. The film is credited with helping MGM recover from debt and was a hit with young audiences in particular. We're young and we love it because there's young people in it and we think everybody over 30 should die anyway. <laughs> Ka. The f- <laughs> sorry, the, f- the film received a generally mixed response. Roger Ebert gave the film a three-star rating, calling the film a... A vast and silly extravaganza with a plot that's a cross between Arthur C. Clarke's The City and the stars and elements of Planet of the Apes that delivers a certain amount of fun. He, gave it, he did give it three stars, so he liked it. Yeah, he enjoys movies. He I, does enjoy movies. I can't help that he just sounds like a weirdo all You know the time. who doesn't enjoy movies? Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune, who gave the film zero stars oh. out of four, calling it unquestionably the worst major motion picture I've seen this year. He described the technological gadgets as lackluster and the script loaded with stupidities and had a preview audience laughing in derision. What he found most contemptible is the way the film never justifies any of its characters' behavior. Jessica's subversive group doesn't do anything except hide in what looks like a boiler room. The main story of Logan's flight consists of a simple fistfight. He concluded, Logan's run is an artistic con job from beginning to end. And honestly, I just gotta ask, who the hell hurt Gene Siskel as a child? (laughs) Well, Gene Siskel gets very angry at movies he doesn't like. Like, God. He's really petty. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, man. He I think a B movie director beat the crap out of him when he was I, a kid. Or he probably tried to write a screenplay or make a movie, and someone goes, "This is awful." Well, that's the difference, because Roger Ebert did write a screenplay for a horrible film. Yeah, and so he knows. Yeah. Yeah. What it's like to go through that process yeah. and then be panned. Yeah. And I don't think I'm not sure. I don't think he ever has that he yeah. ever did, or at least never got one. His, made his screenplays were probably bad enough they never got made at all roger eber was like i suck yeah, he, i'm gonna be a critic hey he pivoted i'm he, gonna yeah. stay in my lane smart move <laughs> yeah look i give him a weird voice yeah but he's you know of the two he's better I, he's, I like like i said i have a love-hate relationship with those yeah. guys i've always i always have a soft spot in my heart for roger ebert roger ebert the movie was nominated for two Academy Awards. Nice. Uh, best Art Direction, losing to All the President's Men. Okay. Uh, and Best Cinematography, losing to Bound for Glory. Okay. Uh, it also received a special achievement for visual effects, but it was awarded after, along with King Kong. Really? Both of them didn't really achieve anything in special effects. Uh, well, originally, the nominating committee for visual effects didn't think any film was worthy of an Oscar that year. They were right. We were overruled by the larger Academy Award. And uh, all of the visual effects committee members resigned in protest. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Literally, it was like four months later. They were like, yeah, we're going to give these away. And then Man, we'll, we'll just give it to, I don't know, Logan's yeah. Run, maybe uh, King Kong. What? <laughs> I'm sorry. Did you watch these no. movies? <laughs> we have integrity. Uh, so William F. Nolan was not happy with the movie adaptation, so he wrote a novel sequel, Logan's World, released in 1977. The best revenge is doing well, Adam. Uh, it's about them uh, uh, coming back to Earth from Mars. Oh, okay. Uh, MGM had expressed interest in adapting Nolan's sequel novel, Logan's World, but Saul David had opted to focus on a television series instead. They paid William F. Nolan $9 million to base a television series on the film. That just seems really excessive. That does seem excessive. really stupid. Yeah. How are you going to get that money back? I don't know. That doesn't make any sense. The resulting TV series Logan's Run, starring Gregory Harrison and Heather Menzies, began with Logan and Jessica escaping the Dome City, then showed them encountering various obstacles in their quest to find sanctuary. I remember watching the show. Yep. I remember Gregory Harrison, he was also on Trapper John M.D., wasn't yep. he? Yeah. Uh, he was like the young, handsome guy. They always had to have like the old, weird, bald dude, and then the young, handsome guy. <laughs> Jake and the Fat Man, or right. Trapper John M.D. Right, right. It was a, It was a formula. But he was always, <laughs> Gregory Harrison was a handsome man. 
The series debuted in September of 77 and ran for 14 episodes before being canceled. Marvel Comics published a short-lived comic book series in 1977. The book was canceled after issue number seven in July. Nolan would write a third sequel novel, Logan Search, in 1980. What was that about? I don't know. I didn't even look. It doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, a possible remake of the film or second adaptation of the novel has been under development since the mid-1990s by producer Joel Silver and Warner Brothers, which owns the filming rights. Directors who have been attached to the remake since then include... Skip Woods, Brian Singer, Joseph Kaczynski, Carl Eric Rinch, Nicholas Winding Ruffin, and Simon Kinberg. I bet our old buddy Richard Donner was on that list a few times. Oh, I'm sure. If it was Joel Silver. Oh, yeah, yeah. Screenwriters attached to the film, who in some cases wrote a screenplay, include... Ethan Gross and Paul Tedisco, Dan Harris, Christopher McGuire, Alex Garland, Andrew Baldwin, Ken Levine, and Peter Craig. And I'm sure also probably Brian Helgeland, too, because he was part of that bunch. Yeah, I'm sure. Various directors have stated that they wish to make a film adaptation that was closer to the novel than the original film had been. I'll make Nolan happy in <laughs> and, his grave. In 2015, the idea was floated to give the remake a female lead based on the success of the female-driven dystopian Hunger Games and Divergent film series. Okay. Yeah. In 2021, the blog Gizmodo speculated that the remake remake project was dead for the foreseeable future after Silver, who had spearheaded the project throughout, resigned from his own production company in 2019. Yeah, it's... I think this would be good like we've seen the television adaptation. I agree. I think it, it would make more sense. I The whole time we were watching it, I was like, oh man, if this had just been like an eight-episode series, you could have gone deeper into the yeah. show, deeper in the characters. You know, it would have been more interesting. You could have incorporated some of the later novels or whatever. Sure. But, like, but if you do it as a... Uh, what I think they should do it as a series and not yeah. remake it as a movie because although... Th- these series adaptations don't seem to be doing extremely well. Yeah. But they're also not, they're not uh, advertising them very much. No, no. And it's not, it's, it, the metrics are super weird it for streaming. Weird. So like, it's hard to know if something's really doing well or not. But this would be great because it, you could do the first book as the first season and the second yeah. book is, you know, you have three built in seasons if you want to go, yeah. you know, yeah. true adaptations of the novels. That's true. Uh, I did uh, download the entire, or I sorry, I do have access to the entire TV series, the 14 episodes that aired. I'd watch so that again. I'm watching all of them, and Jim will watch all of them before our stepdad show, so we can talk about it. Noise. Um, yeah, I'll give it to you. I, I have them. I'll uh, give it to you. I'll give them to you. <laughs> uh, so we'll see. I mean, it, it might be a good, because uh, I've never seen it, so it might be a good way to see if it would really work as a series or not. Oh, it's not good. <laughs> it is not good. It, there's a reason why it only lasted the amount that it yeah, did. Yeah, they actually shot i think three or four more episodes and never aired or just gone yes. to the ether. because i mean they wanted to make it work so badly because they yeah. had wasted so much money on the property but they just absolutely it, ridiculous it's a weird it's a weird story yeah i mean like it's it's kind of i mean you could say like the island was kind of a remake i mean it's, it's a similar kind of i mean it's a different at the end of the day it's a different thing right because it's robots no they're clones being clones. harvested right. for parts and stuff but like the idea is they're in a, a tropical world and then yeah. there, there's no i think this is the thing that was missing for me from this movie that there was no purpose for the computer killing them off at 30 well they say because of overpopulation and lack of resources and all this stuff yeah and I, you know, I just, it probably just was the most efficient way of doing things. Probably. And yeah, there was yeah. no reason to stop it, even though there wasn't any sort of reason to keep it. Right. Also, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of thing. You yeah, know? yeah. The yeah. computer didn't seem like some sort of free-thinking AI. No. Especially since all it took was <laughs> one... <laughs> act, that's not compute. One, that's not one compute. logic question. That's not compute. <laughs> I'm going to blow up the city. <laughs> I mean, boom, boom, boom. Eh, I don't get Although it. you're right, I did. I did actually, I blamed Michael York at first. He forced everybody to leave the city, but it wasn't him. The no. computer freaked out. Yeah, and, the computer freaked blew out, up. blew everything up. Yeah, and then everybody found the old dude and started touching him. It was all weird. <laughs> I would have stayed with the cats if I was old man. I yeah. wouldn't have ventured out. I mean, you had everything you need. He had his walnuts. He had a nice place to stay. He had a bunch of cat <laughs> how, friends. How did he get? And no, no offense to Peter Ustinov, but how did he get that belly? Uh, walnuts he's out are the fatty, middle of Adam. nowhere. Walnuts have a lot of fat yeah, oh, in them. Sure. Is he just eating walnuts? Looks like one? it. He would have had scurvy or something. I don't know. He ate cat. I don't know. It doesn't. He I ate mean, cats and walnuts. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day. <laughs> it, the whole movie is supposed to be an allegory. I mean, it doesn't, you know, logic doesn't really pertain to, to anything. No. And, 
it just it's look it's not a great movie <laughs> <laughs> I, I really, really enjoy not. the first two acts are a lot more engaging than once they leave the city, it starts to drag. A it bit. needed to wrap very yeah. quickly because it, it almost seems like it ends three times before yes. it ends. Yes. Like it almost seems like, oh, ah, they, oh, it's, it's uh, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, yeah. They, they seem to like pick <laughs> from all of the things like, oh, yeah. We'll, we'll pick a little bit from uh, Planet of the, <laughs> the Apes, Apes yeah. with the over, you know, it's it's America. Yeah, oh, yeah. We'll, we'll dig a little bit from uh, Soylent Green. Is, yeah. The robot is making people burgers now. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's like trying to shove a little bit of all of that in there, but it didn't really need it. It was just made it more confusing. <laughs> yes, it did. I, I will say, though, I did get the original Logan's Run novel, and I will read it before okay. the Stepdad show at the end of the month. Yeah, I'm curious. Because um, I am curious. I still need to finish Make Room, Make Room. but uh, Make but Room for there. Daddy! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll say, I still, having... This was the first time I'd seen the movie, mm. uh, and it didn't, didn't quite grab me as much as I wanted it to, but you're right. I mean, the beginning was great. It just had that falter of a third act. It's also an uh, of its time thing, too, I think. Yeah. You know, seeing it as a kid, I misremembered it because I haven't seen it as a child. I didn't remember that he was a sand man, yeah, you know, with a yeah. gun and all that stuff. I thought he was just, in my memory, it was just he and Agater, yeah. uh, you know, as two people that are like, F it, we don't want to die at 30, so we're going to run away. Right, right. But it was a lot more than that. Yeah. In the book, the book is interesting. I do know in the book it's interesting because the Francis character is actually the head of the underground that's like ferrying people out well that would make more sense they uh, kind of didn't do anything with the underground i kind of no, agree with i, I uh, would agree with Siskel Siskel just a little bit that. oh no did the hell freeze over well, i'm not gonna <laughs> say it in a super petty passive aggressive <laughs> way but i will say that yeah i mean they did kind of squander that whole element but it's also it didn't matter because there was no sanctuary yeah yeah they were just basically the bridge for people to escape and the escape was to be frozen and then eaten. Yeah, yeah. Roscoe Lee Brown turning you into people sickles, peep sickles. Uh, which technically Michael York did fulfill his, uh, even though it broke the computer's brain, he did fulfill it because all everything in that sanctuary, the quote unquote sanctuary, died. There is no sanctuary. Yeah. It. Yeah. Answer that question. There like, is I mean, no sanctuary, <laughs> old man. All those weird, like. Uh, Haunted mansion, um, <laughs> the hologram, <laughs> hologram. Yeah, they actually they actually created that for like it's a new hologram technology. They actually they created cool. for the the movie. Yeah. That effect was that. Was it was good. rad. It went on for way too oh, long. Oh, way, way, way too long. <laughs> They're like, well, we we just made it. Let's use it. That was literally the third act needed to be cut down so hard. Yeah, it did. It dragged, and uh, it could have been cut. Like, I think yeah. there's a lot of stuff that could have been streamlined and cut. Up. Streamlined. I think it's better. Yeah, streamlined. You know? I, but I, that being said, it's still, I still love this movie. And, sure. And it is ridiculous. Like, that utopia of everyone wearing wispy clothing and just hanging out. Like, uh, yeah, count me in. Get like yourself in. some edibles, <laughs> some sushi. Yeah. And some sake. There you go. And get yourself some Logan's Run. And I think you'll have a great night. It'll be fun. Yeah. yeah, it'll be fun. We'll be back next week with, oh, baby, Rollerball, one of my absolute favorites yeah. with Mr. James Kahn. Yeah. Jimmy Kahn, baby. Uh, he would play Detarn. De- wow. Woo. Detarn. De- oh, my God. D'Artagnan. 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 <laughs> he would play D'Artagnan. Rollerball with Mr. Kahn. James Kahn. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> we'll be back. Oh, boy. Let me do that again. We now return you to your regularly scheduled program, America's Funniest Home Videos, already in progress. 